years ago. This is a revamped presentation because I was touring around Brazil and I was presenting um, different CLIL workshops. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a foundation, but then I'm going to also um, give you some tips. And these are some um, classroom ideas that you can take into the classroom tomorrow and be able to use. Um, and, and what I encourage you to do is to try at least one idea throughout this year. Now, I also would like to say that um, part of when I was doing CLIL training, um, my resource and one of my mentors during that whole process, because it was a six-week tour, um, was Jeremy Harmer. So Jeremy Harmer at the time uh, was writing a book. Um, the reason I don't have video is because in the past I've had a lot of problems with that. So. Um, just wanted to let you know it'll be on for then I'm gonna take it off <laughs> um, we're having bad weather here in Houston so I'm a teacher trainer I've traveled to over 20 countries as an invited guest expert I've been recognized by the Elton Awards on mo multiple times actually um, for the creation of ELT chat um, and for other, uh, the virtual roundtable, one of the first um, online conferences for language teachers. Um, the New York Times, um, I did a panel for NPR, Microsoft Heroes for Education. Um, recently, I was um, awarded Woman of the Year. And then I was also, um, I've also, one of the most recent projects, so you've probably heard of 30 Goals Challenge, if you know me. Um, that's going on right now. You're welcome to be a part of that. I run an Evo session too, which is ebook Evo. Um, and also, the newest thing that I've done um, that Nellie is actually a part of is Ed Speakers, which is a database um, to bring diversity to um, conferences um, around the world. So that's really exciting. So I'm going to take off this video now. <laughs> you all saw me. Um, so what I called this cooking, I thought, okay, how many of us can relate to cooking? Um, do you know how to, okay, so remember, I took off the camera. Um, do you, by any chance, enjoy cooking? If you enjoy cooking, you can write that inside the chat box, okay? So how many of you enjoy cooking? You do? Okay. And how many of you would, um, find yourself a cooking aficionado or that's something that you really love to do in your hobby times, right? So um, what we're going to do today, and I want you to help me today as well, is to come up with, of course, creative recipes for working with Clue. And so we, when we think about this, uh, one of the things we can think about um, is also eating. And eating is fantastic after a really great meal. Uh, but one of the one problem with eating um, is that we don't want to get too stuck. So you're going to see a buffet of ideas. You're going to see a feast. I'm going to give you tons and tons of um, different meals and, and choices, you can serve yourself a plate, but don't get too stuffed. The reason why I share so much is because there's over 200 of you. So if there's over 200, then that means that I do not know uh, which country you're in, who, who your students are. You know this. So whatever comes to you during this presentation and you say, wow, that's really exciting, then what I would like you to do is to take two items, three items, put it on your plate. And, of course, there will be a recording, so you can always come back and get more. So when we think about cooking, there's a couple of things that relate to Clil. Uh, there are recipes. Um, and even though we follow a recipe, that's what lesson plans, that's what a textbook, and, you know, it, um, that's what these are. When you think about following a recipe, do you always follow it to the T? Are the best recipes followed to the T? Exactly. So depending on your students, what kind of ingredients you have, and by ingredients that could be technology, that could be 
uh, posters, that could be your textbooks. I mean, any type of ingredients you have, then your recipe is going to be different. Some of you may have certain spices and, uh, or uh, fruits or organic items, items that grow from your region that are going to make it much, much better. So when you have, you get to decide that recipe, how you want to make it better. So I think that's really important when you think about CLU. Um, there's going to be different techniques. So some of you may do different uh, ways of making, for example, spaghetti. A lot of us make spaghetti differently. Some of you may want to hand press and create your own pasta. Some of you may want to have sauce that you um, have a certain way. So I really think that um, that's the same way with teaching. You're going to have different techniques. It's good to listen. It's good to go through all of these live presentations that the Cleo, Leticia, and the rest of the crew has um has organized for you, but take these with a grain of salt because it's your recipe. And when it's your recipe, that means that you can change it up and please change it up because it's going to be the best recipe, the best kind of meal that comes out after experimentation. You're going to have to experiment. You're going to have to see. When you implement any kind of methodology, um, even if it's from someone as wonderful as Jeremy Harmer, um, then the, the thing is that they're giving you ideas. They're telling you what works for them, what they've seen with other teachers. But what they're not telling you is, um, well, what they're not meaning is do it this way exactly, and it's going to turn out great. That's not the way it works in reality. Being a teacher, there are things that go wrong all the time. So um, it's really helpful, but I want you to take these ideas and to put your own experiment. If it doesn't work so well the first time, do it again, especially if the kids get excited. And then, of course, the facilities. Some of us may have some awesome kitchens you spent a lot of money on. And then there are other kitchens I've been to that don't really have a pasta maker or don't have a, a grinder and different things like that. So it all depends. What is CLIL? So let's get to the basics, the foundation, kind of like a 101. It's content, language, integrated learning. Um, in America, CLIL, if you want to find resources, um, hashtags are really great. You can search for these on Google. You can search for them on Twitter. You can search for them on Facebook. You can search for them on Google+. You just put a number sign, no spaces. So one is CLIL, another is STEAM, another is STEM. Um, so that's what we have. We have CLIL, STEM, and STEAM. So STEM and STEAM are ways to learn technology. They're ways to learn math and science. And in the U.S., in North America, STEAM and STEM, have a lot of different resources that are very much like CLIL, okay? So I encourage you to take a look at that. Now, there's hard versus soft CLIL, okay? Um, soft is where you have some language learning is taught with the content. And then some of you may do hard CLIL, and, or some of you might be in between, where the language and the content are both taught at the same time. What does that mean? That means, let's say you teach geography, okay? If you teach geography, um, then you may have where, of course, um, you could teach a diagram. Let's say you talk about the cycle of butterflies, okay? And I believe that's something that Jeremy had in his CLIL book. And so when you have soft language, um, it's integrated slowly in the content, okay? You might say the butterfly flies. Okay, look at the verb tense there and things like that um, later. But the idea is with CLIL that you have it both going at the same time. Now, some of you who really love grammar, who really love focusing, if you are in a CLIL situation, then what are you going to do is you're going to teach at the same time, um, but you're going to be, so with the SAW, you're going to be more towards language learning. There's also something called translanguage. Uh, sometimes teachers find 
that it's really difficult to teach their students geometry, um, biology, physics, all of these different subjects in English. At, so what they do is they teach in both. So you might be in that situation where you teach in your native tongue and you teach in English as well, and that's called translanguage. So what I want you to do is, um, if you have a blog post about any of these ideas, so here are some recipes, okay, which are really instructional methods that we can use when using, um, when integrating CLIL. Um, this is what really works. A lot of different um, researchers have said this, um, but one of, exactly, so um, I see Julia, um, has shared um, different as well. But one of the things you can do is um, you can go ahead and you can um, you can write down a blog post or an idea about any of these instructional methods. Or if there's um, a certain a link that you have or a resource, like let's say you have a favorite tool for or a favorite resource for storytelling or digital storytelling, you can go ahead and you can put that inside the chat box. Um, if you have any resource for visual aids, um, a visual aid is then you can, are able to do that. Um, then you can also have, for example, um, you can put a link to maybe if you have a really great uh, TPR or if you have the name of a good TPR game, then you'd be able to find that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change that. Remember, the uh, slides should be available after, so don't worry about it, OK? Um, yeah, graphic organizers are one of my favorite things. You may recognize this guy. Can anyone in the chat box write down who this um, guy is? A very good question. So someone asked, who, what is TPR? That's total physical response. That's, for example, something like Simon Says. Is Simon Says a good game for Cool. What do we learn when we think about Simon Says? We learn science. We learn parts of the body. Hey, uh, you know, um, we can do, or we also learn verbs, right? So we can also, um, for example, the song, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. If you have head, shoulders, knees, and toes, then you are able to learn some things um, as well. You learn head shoulders, knees, toes. So, I mean, TPR is where it's total physical response. PBL can be two things. So that was another question. There's um, problem-based learning or project-based learning. Uh, this person, this famous person, anyone know who this famous person is in the picture here? No? Yes, Leticia got it right. Graham Stanley. He's currently in Uruguay. Um, and Graham has come, this is actually in Brazil, when I was in Brazil teaching, and he came and he spoke to my classroom at the time he was in Spain. So think about all, all of the scientists that are out there. You, one of my favorites is Neil deGrasse Tyson. He has one of, um, he has over a million followers on Twitter. There are authors, look, Raul Dow. There are uh, people, um, curators that are in museums um, all over the world, and all of these will Skype with you. You can have an engineer. You can have a scientist. There are scientists in Twitter that are currently in space that are tweeting as they are in space. So there are really exciting things that happen, and so Skype is one of the easiest ways to integrate CLIL. Now, how do we get language as a part of that? Well, one way is we can have students create questions. We know that questions are actually one way, um, a one type of grammar that our students often have problems with. You can have them curate the questions before. They can create them. They can work in pairs. They can also, um, they and they can de determine if they are going to to ask their guest speaker. They can do some research, and they also found um, um, they can they can find what's going to be effective, okay, for that particular speaker. And then they can go and they can also edit those questions. So that's one way of integrating 
um, content language integrated learning. Okay, we have both going on. So adding little things to your recipe. Yes, we all know how to do Skype, right? Um, we all, I mean, most of us, right? And most of us know how to use something like uh, where we have a video chat with an expert. But um, Skype, education.skype.com, if you get a slash guest underscore speakers, you're going to be able to find how you can um, be able to find where to get these guest experts. So uh, with CLIL, depending on the subject matter the, and depending on the age group, you get to decide who is going to be that guest speaker. You get to decide, your students get to decide who who is going to, what questions they're they're going to ask. Another idea is to have demonstrations. Now, this is where you walk into a room. You may have something like, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll put something like this, okay? And then I come to the students. I can dress in a lab coat if I want, and I can talk about, um, can we guess what's going to happen when I throw this in it, okay? And then we can, we can the students, they can write down and they can do something like a KWL chart where they put K, things they know, um, W where they say what, they, um, what they're going to learn, and then um, afterwards what they actually learn. Now, or they can do something like predictions. They can say, I think that this is what is going to happen. I think this is one of my favorite ones is Think and Float. Um, at Think and Float, we also are able to make predictions. What they do is there's a big bucket of water. The students come, and they can each have something little, an eraser. They can have, um, they can have like a paper clip. And then they have to put down if they think it's going to sink or float, okay? So all of these kind of graphic organizers and charts help them write down, use language, but at the same time, they are learning the ideas that are there. So I think um, that's really great. One of my, how many of you like to sew, okay? Well, one of the things um, th that I think is really, 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 really good is if you're able to, um, ha you learn a lot of math and you learn instructional language if you're able to um, have your students have um, so as well. So there's a lot of um, things that you can do with sewing. They can design costumes. They can design the next costume for a superhero. They can design the next fantastic lab coat. You can give them a problem and things like that. So you learn math. You learn following patterns. Now, the great thing about cooking and um, costume design when you work with students and you have them learn these is the outcome is immediate. So it's a bit of an experimentation. If you know if you got the math wrong, you know how you know if you got the math wrong? Because it doesn't fit, right? Um, or it doesn't come out right. And that's the great thing about cooking as well. If you didn't get the science, the mixing together of the ingredients, if you didn't get, um, if, if you didn't actually get um, stirring and mincing, if you didn't get some things right, then you know it's going to taste bad. You know, if there is too much garlic in your spaghetti, then it tastes bad. You can you can make predictions. Oh, this is where I went wrong. So it's good in CLIL that your students, whenever they do experiments, whenever they work, and they actually create something, get them to create, get them to use math and science or whatever your topic is, your subject that you teach, to do things, um, give them the ability to make mistakes. If it doesn't come out right, it should actually, that's a great thing. You know why? Because then your students, you can say, okay, now let's come together and let's find out why did, did this not come out right. And if you do that, then you're going to go ahead and your students get to learn more because they learn how to fix mistakes. And with CLIL, that is really, really important. Like Stella says in the chat, failing forward leads to innovation. Exactly. Now in the chat, I put... Um, 
I did put something. It's uh, um, I put I put a link shellycarroll.com slash quill, and that way you're able to go and you're able to get the slides. You're able to get the ideas. You're even able to download the slides. Okay, um, so you have all of this. The other um, idea now this is using technology. So before we used a little bit. Of course, you need like a sewing machine, all these kind of things, or you know you need things like. Um, with sewing to cut patterns and things like that. And you can find simple patterns for students that don't take a lot of technology. You can have them do things where they crochet, and things like that. Um, but this is a particular technology with a mobile device, which are QR codes. QR codes are really great for CLIL because they help students investigate. A QR code um, is tied to information. If you scan any of these, QR codes, this is from Flickr, um, you're going to see a video of one of the periodic um, table elements, okay? So this is free to use. You can use diagrams like this to share many, many different um, examples. Now your students, they can create their own QR codes. They can put text, they can put audio, they can put video. One of the best ways that I've seen is this particular one by the PE Geek. Now the PEGeek.com has fantastic ideas for working with science and math and all kinds of great ideas. So I think one of them is um, what he does is he puts it on actual objects. Now Realia, Realia is working with a real object. So for example, if you're teaching um, for example, the parts of the body having a, ske a skeleton, that's realia, that's real, okay, that's a particular method. Um, the other part is, for example, if you're teaching about geodes, okay, let's say we're talking about rocks, we want our students to have a rock collection, which is actually very, very, very good idea and works good with CLIL because you have identification, you have classification, you have labeling, so they have language within it. So when we try to think about that, um, then when we have this particular lesson, you can put QR codes around it, and then the students can scan it, especially something like maybe a geode or something. You can put it in the hard rock area, and then they want to learn more. So that's the problem, is if we stick to the book, that's one of the big ideas about CLEO. Don't stick to the book. Don't just have your students open a book and do problems. They are not going to learn. The way that they learn, is that they do, they explore, they investigate. So when you have a QR code, they scan it with a mobile device. I usually just have my one mobile device in the classroom, and each student goes and they scan. They see a little bit of the information, and then they can do that. Yes, there are free apps. Um, that was in the first slide, so I'll take those free apps. They go around, but you know what's the difference between putting, from between um, having the skeleton in the book and then having a real skeleton with QR codes. The difference is they go and they actually investigate. They want to see what's behind that QR code. So we want to put those opportunities where our students are curious. Students don't open a book and say, hey, I want to learn more about the periodic table. No, they usually don't do that. That doesn't tend to be it sometimes, especially in math and science. Um, any of those subjects, biology, anything like that, it's really tough for them. So if you give them these opportunities, then uh, that really sparks their curiosity and they investigate, and that's really fantastic. So when we come with QR codes, the ones that I recommend are QuickMark. It is free. It is for iOS, Android, Windows, all that good stuff. And iNigma, this one at the bottom, that's the one a lot, a lot of teachers love. Now, QR stuff and Unitag Live are also really good as well. So now I'm going to go and um, we're going to talk again about another. I'm going to take off the video because um, it's running a little slow, my system now. So I'm going to go ahead and take off this video so that way it can run. And that, unfortunately, is what happens when you're on these platforms and you have a lot of people um, attending. So uh, you can use comics as learning materials because, and unfortunately this resource no longer exists, but it's a great resource. So hopefully they put it back up. 
And what it does is it shows that in comic books, when we think of Spider-Man, when we have Spider-Man, what do we, um, how was Spider-Man able to become Spider-Man? Where was he? Anybody know um, what happened with Spider-Man? In a lot of different, um, yes, we took off the video on purpose. There is no video. So, um, okay, so what happened? He was bitten by a spider. Really great, Emmanuel. And where was this spider? Anybody know? Well, one of the reasons um, that comics are good is because it integrates science. So this was actually in a lab. So when you're in a lab um, and you have a, in a lot of these different ways that um, when you ha this is a different periodic table. It was a periodic table of comic books. So what it would show you is that it would show you what element was part of that comic. If you look in comics, then you have, of course, um, where you have um, different elements. You have science. You have physics. You know, you can investigate the physics behind why they fly, why they have a certain power. Um, and you can investigate planets, planets that they go to, um, things like what is kryptonite? Why is kryptonite so dangerous to Superman? Okay, that could be one of the problems that you pose. There is no video on purpose. Um, we have taken off the video. I have taken off the video, just FYI. <laughs> um, so now we're going to the next slide. Um, one other way is it's a good way to present information. I think this is a really, really great idea. This is from rowthings.wordpress.com, which is um, making math problems. If you go to rowthingswordpress.com, you're going to find many, many math problems that are created as comics. This is really helpful for language learners. The reason why is because the language has a visual context, okay? The students are able to count, the students are able to understand word problems and math much better this way. We also can have our students do field research. When I was working with science, then one of the things that we had is that we also had our students go on field research. So we would call a local paleontologist. We would call a local meteorologist in Texas. You can do that. Did you know that you can ask the meteorologist, you can ask the um, you, you can ask scientists and lab engineers to, you can go to these places to do a, um, to also do a, a field trip. And then the scientists can get them to do some kind of experiment. With a paleontologist in Texas, we went and we looked for Texas hearts. Texas hearts are common fossils that we have in Texas. But you're able to also go and you can um, have your students look for fossils in your area. Um, we did one where we were with the River Authority. And the River Authority, they took samples of the water and they took little um, telescopes and they actually looked at the telescopes um, to see what kind of microorganisms were in the river water. So that's field research. There are three. Um, there are three different types of apps that um, are part of that research. So we have projectnoaa.org, um, which is a free, these are free apps. That is iOS and Android. We also have, for example, um, this other app, which is Zydeco. Zydeco is an iOS only. It's only for iPhone. But Project Noah is, thank you, Sandra, and others for uh, letting people know, um, Zydeco is um, for different iPhone, iOS devices. And then we also have BioKids, which is a great app, too. So all of these apps, if you do have a mobile device, they're free. 
Um, they, um, of course, Project NOAA works on multiple devices. The other is on iOS. But the great part of um, is when you do field research, your students get to investigate plants, animals, bugs. They get to investigate tracks and other things around them in their, you can go outside of your class on a really nice pretty day. And what you can do is you can um, have your students take pictures of the flowers, of the plants, um, and different things like that. And then the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about um, some more ideas. One of them is brainstorming, and there's lots of ways that students can brainstorm. They can, for example, now a really, really popular way to brainstorm is if your students um, do sketch noting. Um, this was actually from one of the um, workshops that I recently did about two months ago, so it worked out really well. Like um, on the chat box, I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of links for you so that way that you can find so much more. Unfortunately, we have a limited of time, so because the time is limited, we don't want to keep you here all day. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to send you some more references, some more links, and then you can come and you can um, definitely um, investigate some more because there are more ideas under each of these. So your students can do things like a collaborative sketch note. And actually, you would be surprised about field research. One of the things, um, the re you can make it if it's just around the school then it could be something that is quite quick. Because all of us have bugs, all of us have plants, all of us have rocks and stuff that are part of our school. So you could just step outside the classroom and you can investigate. Graphic organizers, so I just put a link inside the chat box that will um, take you to more graphic organizers. But there are literally thousands of graphic um, organizers. So we have, for example, one of my favorites is Creately.com. Creately has these different types of flow charts um, that are really wonderful. You can see they have block diagrams. They have a chemical chart. They have the KWL chart. I think they even have KWLH. They have object process. They have a part. And if you don't know any of these, like I didn't when I first came and I foundcreately.com, then I was able to learn about so many more ways to get my students to be better investigators and better writers. So creately.com is free. Um, a lot of these ideas, um, they're also, so when you talk about CLIL, usually when you're doing CLIL, it does it is a math and science project. So you usually have things, for example, um, yes, exactly, Anna. I love that definition. Anna says in the chat box um, that graphic organizers, um, and if you could type that again, because the chat box is going so fast, are like a map of keywords. Yes, exactly. So it's really great for the different types of, um, uh, it's great for the brain to absorb that particular chunk of language. Um, then you can do things like this. Um, this is really cool. I love this as well. Um, this was actually a lesson um, that was given and created for English language learners. It's called a zombie apocalypse. So students work together and they solve problems. And that's what um, your students can do too. You give them problems to solve for your area. Okay. So one of the things you can do is you can have them organize into groups of two or three. Then they look at the slides, okay? They, you can do, you don't even have to do these slides. You can make up your own where you say, oh, no, we're at an zombie accomplice. Um, um, yes, they do. Uh, Nadia, that's really, really good. Um, they do it in English. Nadia, if you have problems and you may want to do it, um, what you 
um, when you talk about Nania, for example, um, if your students have a very, very low language, you can do something called trans language quill. Trans language quill, and so that helps with a lot of other um, teachers here in the chat. We do some of it, in, if you're allowed, some of it in the native tongue, and then you do some in English, so that could help. And of course, for primary, there's lots of games. You have things like songs, you have total physical response, and you can do a lot of different, um, you, you can do a lot of different things as well. Um, you can do experiments as well. Experiments are really great um, because they have instructional language. They have bits of language that are also part of the experiment. One of the ones that I like for students are is they get to invent their own love potion. Exactly. They can uh, make it up and they, and they, it's actually a real, uh, I mean, it's actually just a mix. It's like cooking in a way, okay? Um, you can do some really cool special effects to make it have that fizziness. Those recipes are in my, um, if you go to ShellyCharles.com slash Clill, you're going to be able to find all of these links and resources and recipes. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add that as well. Um, the other ones that are really good is, of course, uh, things like making slime, because then your students, they want to do this. These are experiments that they want to do and they learn instructional language. So they can make slime, they can make fake blood, they can make invisible ink and write messages to each other using um, the language that you want as well. Another idea, sorry, the slides are taking a little bit to load. It's because the amount of people in the room I think. <laughs> That's what happens when there's a lot of people. Um, Vine, a General Electric has these little six-second videos. It's called sixsecondscience.tumblr.com. You can see tons of um, different experiments, and it's only a six-second video, which it works out really, really well. Yes, Louis, Louis Stella. Um, exactly. You can have a lot of the ideas in high school, too. And in fact, for these next ones, there are in science. So one of the things that I've been doing with the latest book I'm writing is using um, language of the web, digital language. So there are a lot of ways that you can use emojis to teach your students science and also math. Geography, you can teach them a lot of different biology and things like that. So there's this emoji science, which is part of General Electric. You can click on any of them, and you can see a video by one of my favorite people in science, which is Bill Nye, the science guy. Okay, so Bill Nye um, has these really short videos um, where he uses emojis. And that's going to, that's what the emoji science is. Um, here he explains super materials with emojis, and he has a little super mask. Um, and then we have um, here one of the things I've created um, for the new book I'm writing called By so Potential. Yes, you can do history or art with emoji as well. You can um, show different history. You can even show part of Clil, um that's what part of Clill is also integrating culture. And the great thing about emojis is that now they're reflecting more what people are. So they've changed it to where now um, they have where um, you can have different skin colors for emojis. So they have the different flags and things like that. So in this particular one, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and write down this word problem. Does any, so can anybody figure out what this uh, word problem is? In the next slide, I'm going to give you the answer. This is an emoji word problem that I've created for my um, uh, for a book I'm working on, Bite Size Potential. Um, so can anybody uh, try a hand at this? 
I'm going to see if anyone can write this down in the chat box. Okay, so someone guesses 14. Let's see if this is right. And you were right! Woohoo! So you can see how your students can take a word problem, they can make it into emoji, and then someone else can solve. Very good! We have lots of people now who have put this. Okay, 20 people on a bank. Uh, yes! Exactly, and then you even wrote out what it was. So very, very good. You get virtual applause and chocolate. <laughs> Magic. Now, I also um, learned this from Barbara Butoff. Barbara Butoff is in, I think she's in Hungary is what I want to say, but she came up with this fantastic idea. These YouTube videos where her students learn English by learning magic tricks. And they present these magic tricks on video. They can show them to their parents. They demonstrate how to do the um, magic tricks. This is a card trick. So this is a great way because, of course, we learn the principles behind why the card does this and that. Um, the students will be learning that. So I think that's really good as well. Um, to be able to use magic to learn science and math. Your students can make or invent something. Well, one of my favorite ways to teach, even with young learners, is to use Play-Doh. Play-Doh is one of the best, um, best um, things that I had to teach my students with. Um, for one of them, they created a monster. Okay, so we would say, okay, I'd uh, come into class and I'd say, I have this monster or this alien from another planet. I'm going to describe him to you. And with the Play-Doh, I want you to make him, okay? And so I would say, he has a big head. He has three eyes. He has, so you can have him draw or they can use Play-Doh to make it. Um, we would do things like, hey, make a planet, work in pairs create a planet, um, the next planet we land on, create the next car, create the next um, rocket ship. So there's so much things that you can do with Play-Doh, and you can dictate to them what they can create. Um, you can have them with geography as well. They can create, um, okay, what does Africa look like? And they do the shape of Africa. Um, what kind of animals are on Africa? And they have to make um, a Play-Doh of a creature that's on Africa, um, things like, so there's a lot that you can do with Play-Doh. You can give them recycled materials. Um, we used to do this. We used to collect from all the parents. The parents would give us toilet paper, um, the toilet paper rolls. They would give us um, any type of, um, with literature, okay, with literature they can create um, when you have, when you're teaching literature, like for example, if you're teaching Lord of the Rings, then you can have them create what, when they read a scene inside a book or novel, they can create the background of that scene. That way they try and understand it. They don't know if they say, oh, this took place in England or Scotland and I'm not there, then what they can do is they can look um, on a computer or on or if the book has a picture, or if you have a picture, and then they can recreate it as well. Sorry, the platform is going a little slow. I think it's because there's lots of uh, uh, people. So <laughs> you'll have uh, just a second. Um, uh, sorry, a Shelly, can you do us a favor? <laughs> Uh, can you refresh uh, your page? Okay, so data visualization. They Just refresh your page, uh, and then the audio will uh, not break right. up. Infographic. Refresh your page. Shelly, if you can hear me, can you refresh your page so that your voice will break up?
Okay. Um, let's see. Where were we? I'm working to wrap up already pretty soon, so hopefully you can see what. Um, on the page. Okay, so I went a little ahead. Sorry about that. So infographics. Um, there's many free infographic tools. An infographic looks with charts. They have um, different um, things that they can do, and there is a lot of different um, ideas for it. You can use, uh, for example, Pick the chart is one of my favorites. All of these are free, by the way. S'more, S'more is really great. Um, Thing Link, Tag, Bicycle, all of these are really fantastic for making a digital poster. So your students, you have a poster project, right? Well, one of the ways that you can integrate technology is have them use one of these tools that is free to create a digital poster. Um, this is what it looks like. So here, they give you free templates with PictoChart. PictoChart is my favorite one. With PictoChart, um, you can have a news template. You can see this news template that is there. So you can see this one, this news, SSW today. This one is really good because you can take in literature the characters, two characters, and you can, um, you can compare and contrast them with this template. So it says coffee versus tea, but for history, you could say, for example, the Lincoln-Douglas debate. What is Lincoln versus Douglas? Um, you could do these with the political, um, you can do it also with the different, um, the political candidates right now. There's a lot of different elections going on all the way around the world. I know Argentina, I know Venezuela, I know there's a lot of play, um, places around the world that just had elections. So that's one idea. You can have them do sports players. Um, they can compare one sports player statistic versus another one. Okay. Um, one of the ideas we did recently when I was in Venezuela, we did cat versus dog. We did, um, you know, and diff we interviewed different students and we said, do you have a cat? What do you think um, cats do that is better than dogs? Okay, so the, the students would go around and they did these interviews, and then you can put them in a poster, okay? So that is one of the things that you can do. Uh, Rosanna, if you have a link to it, um, feel free to share the link for that. Yes, exactly, Judy. Um, for history um, and law, you can use infographics. Um, so these are also another idea, social booking, marking, and curation. Um, I hope, I think all teachers have, uh, should use social bookmarking. They should really use, um, they should go and they should bookmark. I use all of these. Um, and I really, really like them, but you can get your students as well. Why students, they use, uh, for example, um, they use different types. They use Pinterest. Pinterest is usually the one that I use with because my students find it easier. The Edge Clipper is really great. It's great for young learners, primary. You can use Edge Clipper. It's like Pinterest for young learners, OK? It's safe. It's protected. It's made for school. Virtual field trips. So someone was talking earlier about going to a tour on a museum, a virtual tour. You can do that. You can have where um, your students can go and they can travel, OK? Um, and they can go and they can go on different filters. Google has one particular area. Um, it's the Cultural Institute. That's google.com slash cultural institute. Of course, you can get all of these links if you're able to um, just click here. I've been putting a link inside the chat box, um, shellycharl.com slash clil, and you'll be able to find the slides. You'll be able to find links. You'll be able to find lots and lots of ideas. Um, and so here you can go and you can visit even places in the past. That works well for literature and history because a lot of the books and the context takes place at a different time. And it's good to put students, especially language learners, 
in that particular context. And the reason why is because it's so different than what the world is now. The world has changed so much for our learners. It's good for them to experience what it is um, that happens in the past. And they can do that visually because it's hard for them to read it and just come up with it. Yes, definitely. Stupid is fantastic. Um, the other part of CLIL um, that the European framework asks is that you integrate culture. And I've mentioned that before. So this also integrates culture. When you travel to a different place, when you have a speaker from a different place, your students are exposed to different cultures. And any kind of, um, any kind of stereotypes or anything like that that they used to have, they come to really um, learn. A, they get to dispel some of those, or they get to ask questions. So I think it's, it's really a, a great idea to have uh, from around the world experts and guests and to travel those places virtually. And you can do it for free. There's many, many places and many museums and stuff you can travel for free. You can even go to the Eiffel Tower. Um, you can see it in 360 degrees. There's also Hollywood in the U.S. has come up with um, different science um, as well. They got experts like this is one from, do you recognize her? Yes, exactly, from the Big Bang Theory. You may not know, but she actually has a PhD. She's a scientist, and I believe it's in neuroscience. And so she has come up with curriculum to help girls um, and boys, and, and um, there's one on superheroes, there's one on space, there's one on forensics. So these are lesson plans that Hollywood has created for free for teachers. They give you the whole, um, um, yeah, exactly, Amy Farrah Fowler. And yes, yeah, she is a neuroscience famous around the world. <laughs> You could do science podcasts. I do that with my students. We listen to things. Now, this is for more adult students, but we listen to um, a segment of Invisibilia, Radio Lab, TED Radio Hour. All of those have different types of history that is shared. The other day, we learned about the history of elevators. We learned about the history of going and um, some science behind elevators. We learned about when elevators were invented. And we got to do practice listening skills, okay? And then our my students went and they made their own podcast. So you can write down a script for a podcast. Um, and you can have your students, of course, they can make their own. They can use any of these free tools as well. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up because the hour is coming to an end. Um, but I want to show you some big ideas that are famous. Um, virtual reality is one, and I forgot to put it there. Uh, these are some students I saw about a month ago in Indiana. And so they have created these objects. These objects you see on the table, um, in the U.S., it's really big to have maker spaces, 3D printing. Um, they made this with a 3D printer, the Yoda there. They made it with a 3D printer. Um, and then coding. There's different types of um, schools, um, uh, things like Microsoft and um, some other places that will give you free uh, maker spaces and 3D printers, okay? So you have to look and see about the grants and the different companies, but because it's so big, right now they're really sharing, they're trying to get this to school for free. You can find a lot of these ideas and more. This was just like a segment um, on my book, uh, Learning to Go, um, and then the 30 Goals, a challenge for teachers. And plan for teachers to make it a little bit easier. So once again, just like I had said in the past, there is a buffet of ideas. Um, you can see my little peg there, Roscoe. Unfortunately, he doesn't want to come in the room. I'm going to go ahead and put my video back on. It's the end of the presentation. But if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me. You can go to ShellyTarrell.com, and you can uh, go ahead and you can um, 
you'll be able to go ahead and you'll be able to get the links, the slides, everything. So I know there was a big, big buffet out there with lots and lots of different things you could take, but only take two or three, and then you can come back and you can always grab some more, okay? So if you don't, uh, oh, you can't hear my voice. Oh, it's because of the internet. Yeah, it, unfortunately, that's why I take off the video. <laughs> So thank you so much again. Um, you can go to ShellyTarot.com slash Cleo. You can find all of these. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, um, on Instagram. I'm everywhere. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask um, at any time. Okay? So thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Shelly. Thanks to Leticia and Nelly for moderating. And... Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for this inspiring webinar. It was really wonderful. A lot of hints and uh, practical ideas for our teachers. So thank you very much. You've been brilliant. Great. Thanks a lot.